Good morning, everyone. If um, you can have um, paper and pencil or a pen to take notes, there's some great information that we're going to be covering today that you'll be definitely using when you start working with clients. So please be prepared to take notes. And um, I know it's not a required text, but if you happen to have e taste heal, um, you can have that nearby because we'll be referring to that. But I'm gonna I'll read and share the the passages, so no need to to worry about that if you haven't gotten it, not at all. All right, it's eight o'clock. Um, we'll start with our uh, pranams, dear Lord Danvantri. I give you namaskar and pranams. Your lotus feet is worshipped by all. You can heal the world from miseries, diseases, ailments, old age, and fear of diseases. Give us your blessings and your medicines so we can help the sick and the unwell. All right. Very good. How is everyone doing this morning in the chat box? You can just check in real quickly. We may have a small group today. Energetic. Awesome. Great. Good today, perfect. And how are your studies going? Is everything going well with your studies? Okay, perfect. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. It's 8.01, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, so today we are actually going to be reviewing um, nuts and Ayurvedic beverages some teas, um, we'll be talking about the benefits of hot water, and then of course the Mandagni, Vishmagni, Tikshnagi uh, recommendations, and then just um, touching on how we can help balance the mind with nutrition. And I know that you've already gotten some of that information in previous classes, but like I've mentioned before, we do a lot of layering of the information because you know, the second time you hear something, you pick up on something that you might've missed the, the first time. And like, I keep on saying, you know, every time you come in and you take a class, it's like another piece of the puzzle coming together. Is the is that analogy a pretty good uh, analogy for y'all? Is that kind of what you've seen? Um, and now, because now you've been in the program for for a couple of months, so are the puzzle pieces coming together every time you jump on another class in the chat box? And everybody, awesome, perfect. And everybody, I would like everybody to uh, to reply. Are the, the puzzle pieces coming together for y'all every time you join, a, 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 when, every time you jump on another class, like something that you picked up from a previous class and now it makes sense in this other class? Yes, too many. Oh, that's what my grandmother said. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do a real quick vocabulary check just to make sure that, um, just for level setting, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, Pachaka Pitta, um, the subdosha, and we find that in the duodenum, there are seven datus. Um, and if you haven't uh, been exposed to this, you will definitely get exposed to this in future classes. Um, so the seven datus um, are, and you'll learn more, they're rasa, rakta, mamsa, meta, and you'll, and you'll learn the, the others if, if you haven't. The srotas are what we call the channels of the body, and that's like the GI tract, okay? And you've had a little bit of uh, introduction into nutrition and other uh, herbs. So then you already know that rasa is taste. The virya is the potency, whether it's cooling or heating. The paka is that post-digestive taste. And you're gonna be learning more about this in future classes. Don't, don't get overwhelmed. I just wanna have the, the uh, vocabulary check just to make sure when you see these in, in the slides coming up, they'll make sense to you, okay? Anupana, um, it's the beverage or the food that actually helps carry the herbs deeper into the tissues and actually can increase the efficacy of that herb, okay? And then of course, all of y'all should know what Vishma Agni and Tikshna Agni now um, mean. Okay, so nuts and seeds from an Ayurvedic perspective. Before we start, I would like to get a feel of it. I'd like everybody who's present in the class. And so we've got uh, seven people, I believe, six people. Um, so I should expect six responses in the chat box. Um, what type of nuts or seeds do you eat? And if you, and I'd like to know if you incorporate any nuts and seeds in your recipes and if so, what recipes? So I need an answer from everyone in the group. If you, um, are nuts and seeds a part of regular, your diet, almonds, sunflower seeds, okay. And if you cook with them, I'm interested in knowing how you cook with them. Sometimes peanuts, okay. 
Well, and that's, that's good, Jamaria. We're going to be talking about that. Jayanti, I don't know what that is. That's interesting. You can want to maybe describe that uh, just briefly in the chat box. Almond chutney. Oh my gosh. I've never had that, but, but I bet you it's amazing. Black seed and sesame. Creating sauces with it. Yes. Yeah. In cereals and salads. Perfect. Thanks, Marion. Did everyone answer if you eating um, Jayanti, it's milk, sugar, and ground nuts. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Desserts, you put them in your desserts, Victoria, almonds and walnuts, great. Okay, and so, you know, the reason I ask y'all if you're incorporating nuts and seeds into your, into your diet and then how, right, and, and I asked you for recipes is because when you're working with clients, this is the information that you're gonna wanna share with your clients and you know I'm all about the why, right? And giving them tools to be successful. And so we're gonna go over some um, different uh, nuts and seeds that are you know, more appropriate for their dosha, but then also uh, as an Ayurvedic counselor, you can help them think outside the box and how they can incorporate nuts and seeds into their diet. Um, and you're gonna learn and you're gonna learn why in a minute, okay? So always all this information, like I keep on telling y'all, start looking at how am I gonna incorporate this? How can I use this with my clients? All of y'all should have a spiral or some notebook where you're taking notes. And, you know, it would be great. What I used to do is I used to put little stars by information that I knew I was going to share with clients. Um, and it, it's very helpful to do that. All right. So true or false, everybody's going to participate. So um, are almond seeds, are they seeds or nuts? What do you think? Are almond seeds true or false? Everybody answer. I'm waiting for other people. Are almond seeds or are they nuts? I guess I should have reworded that. It was not a true or false question. I apologize. All right. Kareem says it's false. Um, did everybody answer? No, I'm waiting for other people to answer. Are almonds a seed? It, this is just for fun, y'all. So it's not serious. I, just, it's, I throw these in just to, to keep everybody engaged and awake. <laughs> All right. Did everybody answer? Are almonds seeds true or false? All right, um, it's true. Almonds are actually a seed, um, but they actually group them with, um, with nuts, right? All right, the brown layer of skin surrounding almonds contains antioxidants, true or false? Thank you, Jamaria, anybody else? And again, don't, don't, be, don't be afraid to answer. All right, did everybody answer? The brown layer of skin surrounding almonds are... Yes, it's true. The brown layer of skin surrounding the almonds actually contains the highest concentration of antioxidants. So it's actually best to eat. And this is a general statement. So we're gonna go back and clarify this, okay? So not for all doshas, but for the most part, um, uh, for the doshas that this applies to, it's best to eat it with the, with the skin to have the most benefits of the, the antioxidants. But again, that's not for all doshas. This is general Western perspective, as y'all know, okay? Pistachios are a sort of heart healthy fats, true or false? Thank you, thank you. Anybody else have a thought? Actually, it's false. You see how I tried to trick y'all? It's actually walnut, walnuts. They're a very good source of the heart healthy fats, um, especially they can, um, specifically they contain more omega-3 fatty acids um, than any other nut. All right, our last one. Um, are cashews nuts? Or are they a seed? Or is cashew a nut or a seed? Actually, um, cashews are technically seeds, um, but they're not only high in protein, but they actually um, are high, they have other important vitamins and minerals, including copper. And you know, we need copper, um, that actually copper supports immunity and, and really helps with the creation of red blood cells and connective tissues. Um, and I wanna know that, uh, I just wanted to share that walnuts are actually a, a great way to boost your protein intake. Um, 
and they have a they have a fatty texture and as you can tell when you eat some you can you can taste it right it's that fatty texture um and i found in the article that i was reading that you can actually uh, add it to your ground meats or to other dishes um, if you want uh, to increase your protein intake. So I share all this information with you as always, because it's information that you can go back to share with your patient, with your clients. And so if you've got a client who says, no, 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 I need to eat because I need my protein. And you know, you're going to have clients who you will not be able to, um, to shake from that because that was a, a very uh, strong belief growing up. So, you know, walnuts, walnuts are another really good source um, for protein that you can share with your clients. I hope that you found um, Marion. That's nuts. <laughs> I love it. All right. I hope that was fun um, and that y'all learned something um, that y'all didn't know before. All right. So let's move on to nuts and seeds. Okay. So actually, uh, many of the benefits that come from, um, from nuts and seeds uh, is actually coming from the oils. Um, and like we talked a little about nuts and seeds, they are another source of protein and that they actually have um, a lot of good min minerals. Like we talked about the, the uh, copper, but it, there's also magnesium and calcium and zinc that we can find um, in nuts and seeds. And so the rasa of, of uh, nuts and seeds are sweet and salty and um, they're, they're warming. So um, if I had to ask uh, just from that information right now, they're sweet and salty and they're warming. What kind of dosha do you think would maybe be uh, not so, not so, um, we should not be eating so many nuts and seeds? Knowing what you know, pitta and kapha. Thank you, Marion. Yep, definitely, right? Because of that sweet, salty, and warming. Thank y'all. Great job, everybody. All right. Um, and so some of the benefits that you're going to see um, with, uh, with nuts and seeds, like we've talked about in the, in the previous slide, that they actually will help build the datus, right? They're going to help support uh, made datu maja, and you're going to be learning more about that. But actually, nuts and seeds are actually very uh, sattvic in quality, okay? So now let's go on to some nuts and seeds and what um, for, for each of the doshas. So... All nuts and seeds, um, if you're vata, lucky you, all nuts and seeds except popcorn are good for vata, um, especially in the form of nut butters and milks, because they're actually going to be easier for, for the digestive system, right? All right, so roasting, um, another idea is to roast nuts with a little bit of salt or simply cooking them in water um, is also really beneficial for vatas. Um, and then soaked and peeled almonds, again, are a great way to pacify vata dosha. Okay, so why do you think in the chat box, why do you, would we not recommend popcorn for vatas in the chat box? Why is that on the list of not to, not to be recommended? Too dry, uh-huh. Airy, perfect. What else? What light, exactly. What else? Vata dosha is comprised, yes, hard to digest, good call out, perfect. Vata dosha is comprised of what? Jamaria, you like popcorn. Yeah, too rough, exactly. What's vata dosha comprised of? What two elements? Exactly. So everything, yes. So think about it. Look at the way that you've described why y'all said that we would not recommend um, popcorn to vatas. Y'all describe the gunas. So good job for y'all. Y'all describe the gunas, right? That, that we find in, in Vata Dosha. And that's why we would not recommend them to Vata. So that's like something that you would want to put a star by. And that's something that you would want to share with your clients. Because just like Jamaria said, she loves popcorn. So you're going to have clients who love to eat popcorn. That's like their little comfort food at the end of the day. Um, and that's how they unwind watching Netflix or whatever else that they watch. So everything that y'all wrote in the chat box, this is what you're going to be incorporating into your discussions with your clients, okay? So I'm not going to go through the list. Y'all get the slides afterwards. I encourage y'all make a note of these, keep these, because this is what you're going to be recommending when you do your, your client encounters for the, the recommendations on their diet. So now moving on to Pitta. Um, the oily and heat, like we talked about the first slide, right? The oily and heating nature of the nuts and seeds make them less suitable for Pitta, right? 
So um, actually it, looking at the list that are okay for pitta, like coconut, sunflower seeds, soaked and peeled almonds, again, another good choice for pittas. But then if you look at the, the slide that's not recommended for pittas, um, you know, peanuts or cashews, pistachios, all salted nuts are, are pitta aggravating. Why would salted nuts be aggravating? Why do you think salted nuts would be aggravating? You know what, let's do this. Um, if you happen to have eat, uh, taste, heal, we're going to read some passages together. And if you don't, it's okay. I'm going to read it, but let's turn. If you happen to have a book, um, and again, it's not recommended, so it's no big deal. I'm going to read it, but we're going to talk a little bit. Yes, Marianne. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Perfect answers. Salt is heating, increases heat in the body. Perfect. So we know that um, I'm going to be reading on page 47 about salty taste. Um, salty, salt is uh, comprised, uh, composed of the fire and water. It's hot, heavy, and moist by nature. Due to its drying quality in the mouth, it may seem counterintuitive to think of salty taste as moistening. The element of water in its composition, however, relates to its water retaining quality. Okay. Salty taste falls somewhere between sweet and sour taste with regard to its most quality, uh, moist quality. While salt, oh, I'm sorry, while sweet taste stimulates the greatest water retention and weight gain in the body, salty taste will have similar effects when used in excess by any of the doshas. And on the next page, we're gonna read, the warming, and somebody already said that it's heating, right? The warming and grounding effects of salty taste are beneficial for balancing which dosha, y'all? In the chat box, which dosha is this gonna be? Perfect, thank you, thank you but increase both pitta and kapha. In pitta individuals, the heat associated with this taste can lead to, make a list of this if you, if you can, hyperacidity, high blood pressure, skin rashes, grayness and loss of hair, wrinkles, and eye problems. I'm gonna go through the list one more time. In pitta individuals, the heat associated with this taste can lead to hyperacidity, high blood pressure, skin rashes, grayness and loss of hair, wrinkles, and eye problems. So if y'all have a client, a female client who loves to eat salt, I grew up with the salt shaker on my table. And I don't know about y'all, how many of y'all grew up with salt and pepper on your table when y'all, on your dinner table? Yep. And how many of y'all grew up um, adding salt to your food before even tasting it. And please don't make me feel bad. I don't want to be the only one. How many of y'all added salt and pepper to your food before even tasting it? Ooh, everybody answer me, please, in the chat box. No, sometimes. Yeah, I, that was such a bad habit. After you came to US in restaurants, your mom didn't cook with, yep. Yeah. So um, it, it, it was just very common. We always kept salt and pepper. And that's what my, my family, my grandparents, we all added salt and pepper to the food after it was cooked without even tasting it. So, um, when, so if you have female clients who are very worried about their skin, you can educate them and tell them that um, in the pitta quality, with that, that warming and, and especially with pittas, it can actually lead to wrinkles. When used in excess by kapha individuals, the dense water retaining qualities of salty taste can lead to obesity, swelling, high blood pressure, and edema. So another great point to be educating your clients on. When used in excess by cough individuals, the dense water retaining qualities of salty taste can lead to obesity, swelling, high blood pressure, and edema. All right, I hope y'all found that um, helpful. So um, it's just really, really important that you learn how to use your resources uh, you know, you learn a lot of information in the counselor program, but it goes by very, very quick. Before you know it, um, you'll be graduating just like the class who graduated this week. And um, you would have you would have just absorbed a lot of information, but your learning does not end um, and it does not start and it does not end every time you log on to a class. Ayurveda is um, something it's, it's just something that you will continue need to be learning and, and studying. So even on the days where you don't have uh, you don't have class, 
you know, the expectation for all this information to stick, you all have to be doing study, you all have to be doing homework, you all have to be studying and reviewing every, every day, you've got to review a little bit, a little bit more. And part of that is knowing how to use your resources it doesn't mean that you need to have everything memorized, you know, you're not going to have this list memorized, right. But know what your resources are, and which are the credible resources and learn how to use your resources. All right, so moving on to cop up. The, we've already talked a little bit about this, but the heavy oily quality of most nuts and seeds actually don't, they're not suitable for kaffa, right? Not so much, right? But as a protein source, they are preferable to meat and dairy for kaffa. Um, so pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, they're great choices for kaffa, again, in moderation. Um, but then, you know, coconuts and almonds, sesame seeds, peanuts, pine nuts, and walnuts, they're all going to be in a and all the other lists, the other nuts on this list, they're all going to be very uh, kapha aggravating. Okay. So, did y'all see in any of these slides with vata pitta kapha? Um, are y'all favor? Are y'all eating um, the correct or the incorrect uh, nuts and seeds in your diet? If you want to to share, are y'all? Um, Mix, okay, awesome. Anybody else? Mostly correct, good job, Mary. Anybody else? Incorrect? Sometimes not so right, yeah. And you know, almonds have become very, very popular. Um, you know, for the longest time, I kept almonds at my desk at work and I would just munch on those throughout the day. So uh, when people, that's one of the reasons why we ask uh, our clients what they snack on because they think nuts, you know, nuts like almonds are very healthy and they may not want to, they, they, they might, they may oversee it because they think, oh, well, it's, it's a healthy snack, right? And so again, this is going to be a point, another learning point, an education point when you're working with clients. So moving on to Ayurvedic um, beverages. In your chat box, I want you to write one thing that you know about what types of beverages we're going to be uh, recommending for our clients. Anything having to do that you've learned so far regarding the beverages um, and choices for uh, your to pacify doshas? Anything that you've learned so far that you want to share in the chat box? Anything about, even if it's just something, the basic one that we all learned about. What are you encouraging your, your clients to drink? CCF, perfect, perfect, perfect. What are you encouraging your clients to drink in the morning, first thing when they wake up? Simple, simple. Yes, thank you. Warm water, perfect. How many of y'all drink smoothies in the chat box? And if so, what kind? How many of y'all, Jamari, you don't? Does anybody drink smoothies? And if so, what kind do you drink? Not me, Kareem. No, very rare. So actually smoothies have really, really grown in popularity, right? There's smoothie places all over the place. All, I mean, you, you drive all over town and you've got everybody selling smoothies, right? And actually, because they're very easy, if you think about it, Jamaria, you, you, you make a very good point. This is, and I think that's why it's, it's this huge market actually. So I was looking at, I was looking up some research about um, how popular uh, smoothies are, but because they're so easy to carry around, and people really feel like they're doing something healthy for themselves, right? Because that's how they're getting their source of uh, fruits and vegetables is through these smoothies. But if you think about it, they all have a liquid base. I don't know if you've seen how they, how they make them. Sometimes they use milk. Sometimes they use yogurt. Sometimes they even use ice cream or cottage cheese. They, and I see that they use crushed um, ice and non-dairy milk. Then they put honey and then they put sugar. Then some of them put whey powder and chocolate and all these other supplements, right? Yeah, sugar syrups, exactly, right? So think about, um, and then sometimes they even add like oats or though they use uh, uh, almonds. So it's, they put everything you can possibly put into these smoothies, they just dump it in there. So now what did you learn at the very beginning of, this, of, the, of the counter program about incompatible um, foods? So think about all the incompatibilities. They're throwing, exactly, thank you, Kareem. No dairy with fruits. Yes, yep. Sour and milk don't go together. Perfect. Y'all are on it. Good job, everybody. 
So you see, this is going to be another thing that you're going to have to educate your clients. So, um, you know, because they, they really do think that they're doing a good thing. And so we want to talk to them in a way that, you know, praise them and recognize them for being very health conscious and, and being very aware of what they're putting into their body. And so you want to give them that recognition. And then you want to then present why in Ayurveda, we do things a little bit different. And this is the reason why we don't think that smoothies is the best way to get uh, a lot of the fruits and vegetables into our diet. So actually, um, just a little fun fact here, um, that in the US, drinks made from raw fruit and vegetables started selling in the 1930s after the invention of what do you think? It actually came after the invention of the electric blender. And then actually the, the term smoothie was actually not coined until the mid 1980s. Um, and again, we see there was a Nielsen study that showed that 88% of millennials are willing to pay for healthier options. And so again, you know, this is something that you're gonna see in your clients. I see it all the time, people drink smoothies. It's just a very common thing that people will, will, um, will share with you as part of their, either as a meal replacement or for a healthy snack. Um, and then the other thing, all of y'all talk really about the incompatible food uh, combinations. But then the other thing also is that if they're drinking a smoothie first thing in the, in the morning, what's gonna, what are they doing by drinking a cold drink in the chat box? If they start there, yes, great job, great job. They're putting out that digestifier, right? Awesome. Thank y'all so much for jumping in on the chat box. I appreciate it. All right, so in a, um, from an Ayurvedic nut uh, nutrition um, perspective, when we're talking about uh, beverages, we know that you know, what we drink um, can actually benefit the mind and body, right? It's just like the food. It's, it's part of our thera therapeutic, part, part of our protocols. We believe that food can heal the body and including beverages, okay? And not including smoothies like we just talked about, right? Or processed juices and sodas. Another big market that's increased has been the juice market. Um, and again, even becoming very uh, creative with different juice blends. And again, people feel like they're doing a good thing by drinking um, all these different food uh, juice combinations. And it's very expensive. If you go like to the stores, like some of those juices um, with different combinations are, are pretty expensive, but people are doing it because they think that they're doing something healthy for themselves, right? And so from an Ayurvedic perspective, um, we want to, uh, we, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So Ayurvedic perspective, uh, beverages just aren't teas or vegetables. From an Ayurvedic perspective, we're looking at the soups and lassies, which you're gonna learn more about in um, herb syrups. Um, so from the Ayurvedic perspective, beverages, um, like everything else, we're gonna consider the dosha, right? Um, we're gonna consider the rasa, the virya, the vipaka, and even the temperature of the beverage, okay? Because we're actually looking at, you know, how it's gonna help us balance the doshas, right? When we'll start working with our, our clients, um, either by uh, reducing or increasing um, a datu, um, maybe the, the datu has been uh, decreased, so we wanna increase it, we wanna balance the datus, and then how we can use the Ayurvedic beverages to help support clearing of the srotas, those channels of the body that we talked about. All right, so water, um, and I have met some of y'all already um, during the, the live uh, workshops. And you know, one thing that, uh, that if you've noticed, everybody, we all come in with water, right? We all come with, with a jug of water. We come with, with um, I had brought some bottled water in to make sure that everybody had some water to drink. Um, the, the whole global bottled uh, water consumption has completely just, boomed over the last 10, 20 years, right? But what we wanna remember is that a lot of uh, clients, when you ask about their water intake, they may be thinking of just plain water, but what other uh, types of water will you want to maybe prompt a little bit? There's other types of water that a client, when you ask about the water, they might just be thinking of regular tap water, coconut water, tea, what else? What about the sparkling waters, y'all? Yes, Marion Seltzers, exactly. Yep. And so all this mineral water, yes, exactly. So huge, huge market. So whenever you're talking to your clients about water, you're going to want to dig a little bit deeper because in their mind, all you're asking is just like plain water, like regular water, right? They're not going to remember 
um, the sparkling water. They're not going to even think about the flavored water sometimes. They're not considering that part of their water intake. So from, from a dosha perspective, what dosha do you think might need um, just a little bit less water in their diet? Just a little bit less water. Yes, perfect, y'all. Good job. Yep, kapha dosha, right? So vata and pittas, um, we're definitely um, going to want to, you know, support, encourage them to drink water because of that dehydration that they experience, right? Um, but we know that kaphas, they they tend to retain, right? And so we're going to, we're really going to want to pay attention in particular to your clients with an increased kapha dosha. You're really going to want to dig down to see how much water they really are drinking, okay? And then I want to ask a question in the chat box. If you um, had a client who drank a lot of coffee throughout the day, um, what advice would you give them? Just out of curiosity. Drink water at, at very least. Yeah, drink some water at least. Yep. And Marion, why, why are you going to tell them that? Drink more water. Yes, Jayanti, very good. Move frequently. Yes, it's dehydrating, drying quality, perfect. Yep. So again, yes. Yep, y'all are on it. Y'all are gonna do so great once y'all start working with your clients. All right, so uh, hot and warm water. <clears throat> so we know, um, that we, this part of our basic protocol for all of our, you know, most of our clients, we want to have them start their day with um, some hot and warm water. Um, <clears throat> it's really good to remove the, uh, drink another kind of warm beverage. Yep, Kareem, exactly. And that's when you're going to help them as a counselor, you're going to give them different options and you're going to be learning about some of those um, in the next couple of slides. So that hot and warm water actually is really good for removing that water soluble ama. Um, <clears throat> and if there's, um, you might need an oil like ghee to remove the oil soluble on mine. You'll be learning more about that. But it does increase Agni, right? So it's going to be really, really good for the vatas and kaphas. It's really good for increasing absorption and assimilation of foods and nutrients. And so if you have clients, <clears throat> some of you all have already been doing a lot of um, uh, classes on, on well, the, the workshops we've had on the weekend when we're looking at tongues. Um, what about the tongue? Have you all learned on the outside uh, edges of the tongue? Those little scalloped edges, remember? Have, do y'all remember those? And what is that a sign of when you see somebody with the scalloped edges? Do you remember? A client with the, uh, the little uh, scallops on their tongue um, is a sign of malabsorption, that they're having problem, right? And so having them drink warm water in the morning is actually going to help them increase the absorption of uh, assimilation of those foods and nutrients. And actually warm water actually helps, um, is actually reaches the, the datus faster uh, to hydrate them. And it's going to um, increase rasa and that water mahabuta. It acts like, like I mentioned at the beginning of class, water is a very basic anupana that you're gonna use when you start working with herbs and offering clients your herbs to help bring the increased efficacy of that herb into the datus. And then, as opposed, and this is a why here, this is something you're gonna to wanna to share with your clients, cold water actually increases vata and kapha, right? And that's what can actually lead to your imbalances. And, you know, datus don't absorb cold water. Thinking about that, think about the, the when you get cold, how do you feel, um, just think about your body. Thinking about, thinking about your body, when you're cold, you shiver and you draw your elbows in and you start bringing your elbows and your, your arm, you wrap your arms around together, you're, you're constricted, right? Cold is constricting, right? And so that's why the, the doctors um, can absorb the cold water very easily. So cold water, if you've got, and this is another thing that you're going to see with your clients, it's very, very common, um, especially if you're working, um, yeah, Jamaria. Um, and this is one of the things that you're going to want to recommend to your clients, especially the clients who live in southern states, um, where we grew up with iced tea every meal. It's just very common or, or other cold drinks. 
So what would be some um, recommendations on how you can work with clients um, to help them educate them regarding um, not drinking cold drinks? Any thoughts? What's some, th some things you might wanna share with your clients? And don't overthink it. Just maybe something that you've done already making, making changes on your own while in the counselor program. Anybody have any thoughts? Order water without ice yet, Marion? What else? Yes, preferably possibly of doing it just rarely after two meals, okay. So you know what I, I tell clients when um, I, I talk to them about water and, and not having it iced? Because everybody freaks out, I will tell you. Yes, then slowly decrease the coldness. That's exactly what I do, Jayanti. That's exactly what I do. Um, explain slowing of digestion. Yes, Jamaria, exactly. That's exactly what I do. Those are the both, both are two things that I do. I always give the, um, I'm from South Texas, y'all. So um, I grew up, I, I know I keep on telling y'all, but I grew up eating barbecue. So for me, um, one of my go-to analogies is the barbecue pit. And if, you know, what they're doing with, if the fire is burning bright, you know, and then they put a, you know, a bucket of cold ice water, what it's going to do to the fire. I, I really try to give a visual, right? And so I use the barbecue pit um, to explain a Tikhna Agni and Manda Agni and, and Sama Agni. And so that's what I do. But then I also tell clients, look, if, you've, you, if you're used to drinking cold iced tea with lunch and dinner every day, that's what you've done for the last 30, 40 years of your life. I get it. It's going to be hard to go cold turkey. Some people will go cold turkey. I had a client recently that I worked with and she was just at a point in her life. She just was ready to make all kinds of changes. And she's done a really good job of sustaining them. But for the most part, diet and lifestyle changes will be hard for your clients. And so what I tell my clients is like, if you can, if you're used to drinking um, a glass of iced tea and the, it, the glass is full of ice, can you decrease it to one third the amount of ice? Instead of drinking, you know, the whole cup, filling up your whole cup of ice, can you decrease it at least to one third? Minimize the ice. And then if they, if I tell them, you know, or can you, if the, the tea is already cold, can you just drink it without any additional ice? And then I tell them, and then, you know, gradually the, 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 what you would really want to do is you really want to get away from drinking cold drinks altogether. And then we do the whole education piece, but it's, it's something that you're really going to have to work with your clients on. All right, so this is one um, example that you can share with your, uh, with your, this is recipe number one. So if you wanna make notes of this, so cumin, coriander, fennel, some of y'all already dr uh, drinking this. It's great for clearing the blockages in the srotas and increasing Agni and helping Agni um, move back to the GI tract. Um, it's also great for bringing balance to the datus and removing ama. And it's actually very, very easy. How many of y'all, um, yeah, Mary, in general, we, we don't, yeah, in general, we definitely want to encourage our clients to drink room temperature just because of the state of the, of the, of the Agni. We always want to maintain. And, and think about it, even if a Pitta person has Tikhna Agni and you think that's okay for them to drink uh, iced water, well, now you're putting them in the opposite direction. You're causing another problem, right? And Jonathan, you're right. A lot of people don't like the taste of tap water. You're right. So um, how many of y'all make uh, your own uh, CCFT in the chat box? Yeah, it's very easy to make. And then Banyan, uh, okay, Jamaria. Yeah, uh, you can just make equal parts of coriander, uh, cumin, coriander, and fennel. Um, it's really, really great. I, I make it and I drink it at work throughout the day. I just sip on it at work. Um, Banyan Botanicals actually has, you don't need to buy all the spices all mixed in together because you can just do it on your own, but they do have it all mixed if you want to just make, make it easier for yourself. Um, and then some options to add ginger, cinnamon, uh, cardamom seed. Um, of course, those are going to increase pitta in excess, right? Um, so that's one basic recipe. Honestly, this 
the CCFT is something that you will recommend very, very frequently to your clients, okay? Here's another recipe that y'all can, um, this is almost tridoshic. Um, it's gonna be really good for uh, the Vata mind, for balancing Agni again, strengthening and tonifying, um, good for stomach disorders, clearing the mind, the srotas, uh, bringing balance to all your doctors, removing ama. And this is a, a rejuvenative kashaya um, with coriander, fennel, cumin seeds, ginger, cinnamon, turmeric, black pepper, saffron, almond milk, or, or organic milk. Um, and then you can add a little bit of tulsi and cardamom if you want at the end. Again, very, very, uh, yes, these are, these are just your, your and these are your, your common kitchen herbs, y'all. This is something that, that um, very common that your clients will be able to find at the grocery store. This is another uh, recipe for you to consider. Um, again, coriander, fennel, cumin, plus a half a stick of cinnamon, ground ginger. And um, if you also want to add one or two cardamom pods, um, this kashaya actually nourishes all the datus and brings them into balance. It also supports and stabilizes uh, Dathna Agni. Um, so it's going to help alle alleviate digestive sluggishness. It's going to help remove ama and clear the srotas. Um, and actually helps uh, alleviate symptoms of Pachaka Pitta. Do y'all wanna leave this a little bit longer so y'all can um, take a note of it? Did y'all catch the rest of them? Y'all want me to go back? No, Jamaria, they're not. I mean, there might be variations. I'm not gonna say that, but these, uh, I think these came from previous students. Would y'all want me to show y'all the slides again? One more time. Oh yeah, you can print the presentation. Yes, if that's what you're doing, Marianne. Perfect. And um, I mean, she's even in this recipe, she's even telling you how to, you know, while the water is bringing, building up to a boil, you use your mortar and pestle to grind your, uh, your seat, your, uh, all your herbs. Um, how many of y'all have a mortar and pestle at home? How many of you uh, have a mortar and pestle at home? Th this is just the, the, yeah. And actually, if you have like a coffee grinder blender, blender that can grind um, these herbs into like a powder, then you could use that also. So if you don't have a mortar and pestle, um, I encourage you to, uh, to go ahead and get one um, this week. Um, because you'll be you'll be needing it. All right. So if you don't have a mortar and pestle, uh, and the dry dry grinder that um that grinds your your herbs into like a powder, Dianthi, is that what you're talking about? Okay. So that's one of your homework. Okay, perfect. Then you'll be fine. You'll be fine. All right. So if you don't have a mortar and, and pestle then um, please um, have one for next week, okay? All right, so this is a really helpful slide. I'd like for you to make a note of some of these teas and just focus in on uh, some of the common teas. Um, these are some things that you're going to wanna to definitely recommend for your clients. For vatas um, at the time of, uh, Okay, Manjulali is gonna give you more instructions. Um, so for vatas at time of season, um, of, of changes of the seasons or flu, uh, licorice uh, tea is yummy, um, or ginger, organic ginger tea, or cardamom, all these are warming, right? For pittas, um, the organic, the cardamom, the licorice uh, also, uh, but if you'll notice here that there is an inclusion of the rose petals and um, coconut milk, right? Because we know that those are cooling. And for kaffas, also uh, some warming teas. There's Rod, uh, Raja's cup. Uh, it's a coffee substitute in, um, made of clearing nut licorice. Uh, I've never tried this. How many of you have tried this as a uh, substitute for coffee? I, I personally have never um, tried this. And then, no, yeah. Tulsi tea is actually very common tea that a lot of people are drinking. I see it in our break room at work a lot. Um, it's good for batas and kapas. And Tulsi with a rose blend um, is actually really good for pitta as well. 
This is another great slide. I'd like for you to make a note of, of some of the most common teas that you can find either at restaurants or you can find at the grocery store. Make a list of the teas that you've already uh, had, that you incorporate in, maybe that you, you drink on a regular basis or that you purchase on a regular basis, because the, this is the list that you're gonna be recommending to your clients. So pull out the teas that you know that they can either find in restaurants or at the grocery store, that they're gonna be easy. Right, we want to make we want to make it easy for them. Tea is actually the most the second most widely consumed beverage worldwide, following um, water. And as we all know, drinking hot and cold teas has become really popular. Um, there's a lot of I mean, even the little uh, tea um, like coffee shops that they have them for tea tea houses is very very popular. Um, and people are, I think uh, people recognized that uh, sodas were unhealthy. And so that's what drove a lot of the, the market. Uh, people drive, drove them to looking for healthy alternatives, which is teas. And you'll see at the grocery store, there's a lot of different now combinations of teas as well. You know, tea with all kinds of things. Um, so definitely, yeah, Marion, you're going you're gonna to be going over that uh, in, an, in another class because we do need for them to be dry, right? Um, and so then um, it's, what are the most common teas in this list that you've seen at, ro at restaurants? Real quick, in the chat box. What, what are some common teas that you see in restaurants that they're serving in restaurants? And I'm sure they're all artificial, right? <laughs> but anyway, green tea, yep, mint, chamomile, jasmine, peppermint. What else? Black tea, mm -hmm. Earl Grey. What else? The berry teas are very popular. Hibiscus, thank you. I was waiting for one of y'all to catch that out. Hibiscus tea is, I mean, is very, very popular. Thanks, Cass, appreciate it. Yeah, and so your clients are gonna be, you know, very, um, they're, they're, they'll be very exposed to drinking teas and they'll be very receptive to drinking teas. And you wanna make sure that you, you help pick them, um, pick flavors that you know that they'll like so that's easy to incorporate into their, diet, into their diet. All right, so we talked at the beginning of the class that when we're looking at from uh, beverages from an Ayurvedic perspective, it's more than just a tea, right? And it's just more than water. We're looking at, um, you know, soups. We're looking at lassis. We're looking at broths. We're vegetable juices. All that is what we consider to be Ayurvedic beverages, okay? So for Vata, we would like to, we're gonna be encouraging um, sweet and vegetable, um, uh, potato, barley soup, um, those grounding brothy soups, lots of ghee, right? Um, not so much those thick chunky, um, but small pieces of vegetables, um, mung bean dal, very, very good. Again, thin soup, more like a beverage, right? Lassi, the really good source of pro probiotics. You can add some warming spices, right? And then serve it at room temperature. The pittas, definitely, we always know benefit from coconut water, rose water, um, and your doll soups as well. So this is a really great um, slide. Kaffas, we know we want to help stimulate the Agni. So we're gonna be looking at warming, Agni increasing those scraping um, type of, of spices. Um, and if nothing else, always remember um, to include the hot water. And for your kaffas, the hot water, not just before the food um, or just after, but even um, they can sip on it every few hours, right? <clears throat> and again, the broths for the in smaller amounts and doll soups as well. So for Manda Agni, um, so here are some kapha pacifying protocols. <clears throat> We've already been talking about this and you've been learning in other classes. So lots of um, you know agni um, increasing spices and you know definitely uh, you know like cayenne pepper black pepper ginger turmeric nutmeg cinnamon um, and then of course you know the teas but always recommend the hot water even if they're uh, incorporating the steamed vegetables we want to make sure that they're adding those warming spices um, when they steam their vegetables Tomato and apple chutney. Oh my God, y'all are gonna make some, which is so yummy. To this day, I still use a tools recipe. I love tomato and apple chutney. That just was not a part of my diet growing up, y'all. So that's why I just think it's like the best thing. 
Um, pomegranate chutney is going to be great for not only for women's support issues, but um, also good for, for pittas. And then mung dal soup with lots of those coffee spices, right? And then um, avoiding rice um, or in very small amounts is okay. And then we definitely know that coffee should avoid or minimize uh, a lot of the fats and oils from their diet. For Vishma Agni, so we're gonna want to help pacify their diet with sweet, sour, um, right? And natural salts. Um, so hydrating vegetables and fruits, sweet vegetables with lots of fiber, um, cook with ghee, uh, whole grains for breakfast and lunch. Um, and of course, definitely we want our vatas to um, stay away from raw foods. All sweet foods, uh, fruits should be cooked. So again, this is another why when you're working with a vata who loves smoothies, right? And they like it cold. Um, bananas roasted in ghee with sugar, so yummy, 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 if you haven't had it already. Strawberry chutney with warming spices like cinnamon, hing, sugar, um, nutmeg, um, again, apple chutney, um, the ripe tomato chutney. I'm getting hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet, so this is making me hungry, actually. Um, and then the vata pacifying kitchidi, the mono diet, um, which I love, um, and you'll learn how to make it, and I encourage y'all to, to incorporate to try that and incorporate it into your diet. And then, um, you know, hot water also and some of those vata friendly teas that you already um, learned about in the previous slides. So for Tikshna Agni, um, we want to focus on those pitta pacifying protocols, right? Um, focusing on the room temperature water, we talked a lot about that. Coconut water is another great, a great option for, uh, for pittas, rose water, rose jam, pomegranate, um, the juice or the jam, uh, buttermilk, um, whole juice of the watery vegetables like fresh zucchini, squash, carrot juice, good for uh, pittas, and then kitchidi with rice and mung dal, um, gruel with coriander seeds. And as opposed to kaffas, we, we want to encourage pittas to cook with ghee um, mostly, and sunflower oil is okay. And when we say ghee, um, of course, if they don't already have um, high cholesterol, right? So we just have to be very mindful of that as well. And we definitely want uh, pittas to avoid citrus and acidic foods and you know, high salt foods. All right, so what are, what, um, are balancing tastes for vata? Do y'all remember the chat box? What tastes, which rasas will, will balance? Uh-huh, sweet and salty. What is the other one? One more. Sour, thank you. And what about pitta? What three tastes? Perfect, what's another one? You don't, ha you don't have to know all three, y'all can just name one at a time. Yes, there's one, one more. One more, it begins with an A. Ah, great job. Kaffa, what's gonna balance kaffa? What type of tastes? Yep, so punch and bitter and astringent. Good job, everyone. Again, y'all, this is your foundational information. We're gonna keep coming back to it, keep coming back to it. So um, like Vata, look for acronyms. I I'm I grew up, I'm old school, so I grew up with acronyms. Vata SSS, sweet, sour, salty. So just find a way to make this information um, top of your mind. It it's a lot, I, I understand. All right. So sweet, the sweet, sour, salty tastes are gonna help vata feel what? How are they gonna feel? How is it gonna act on their mind? That the sweet, sour, sattvic. Mm, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. grounded, perfect. Yep, it's gonna help them feel grounded, right? And what about the 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 taste of um, if a person? Yes, calming. If a pitta person has too much of the sour, salty, and pungent, what do you think? How's that gonna act on their mind? How do you think they're gonna feel if you've got a pitta eating a lot of sour food, a lot of salty, aggravating, uh huh, agitated? Good job, everybody. And then what if you have your um, kapha person eating a lot of the sweet, sour, salty foods? 
having a lot of those, how are they going to feel? What's the action on sweet, sour, salty, sluggish? What else, y'all? Lazy, perfect. What else? Yes. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are on it. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave this slide up. I know some of y'all are printing um, some of the slide decks, it, but I'm going to leave this slide up um, because you might need this information in just a few minutes. So take a picture, make some notes. So the sweet and the bitter stringent taste um, for pitches is going to help support them, um, you know, with their patience and feeling satisfied with their communication. So maybe they're not coming, coming across very angry or frustrated, right? And kapha, if we have more of that, if they have more of that pungent and bitter stringent, it's going to help with their motivation and, and helping feel less stuck. And it's going to be very interesting. Once you start working with clients, people with a lot of kapha, it's going to be, it's not uncommon for them to tell you, I feel stuck. And they will tell you, that's exactly how they're gonna feel. I feel stuck. Um, I personally have one of, you know, one of my daughters right now has a, is going through some stuff with a lot of kapha imbalance. And um, oh my God, for the last two, three weeks, all I hear is she feels stuck, she feels stuck, she feels stuck. So um, it's, it's you're, the, these are the terms. You're, it's gonna be very interesting once you start working with clients, how you, you're you gonna start seeing this all come together. All right, so y'all took notes, I hope, because we're gonna need them right now. So here's a mock client encounter. Joe is a 20 year, 28 year old, very stressed computer engineer. He works long hours. He does hatha yoga three times a week and would like to gradually move towards a vegetarian diet, but does know how, doesn't even know how it could be maybe possible because he really enjoys the taste of an occasional steak. He doesn't eat too much steak, but just every now and then um, he likes to have a good steak. Um, he likes hamburgers and bacon and feels um, better when he has one protein shake a day. And we talked about that in the class, right? He does, he does like drinking hot teas. Um, and after your thorough assessment, you determine he has increased vata dosha, okay? Um, because this is just a little bit of information, but when you met with him, the more and more that you learned, he has vata and balance, right? So what tastes will you encourage for him to favor in his diet? And we just reviewed this. So what three tastes are you going to educate him on? Oh, you're so good. Yes. Awesome. Sweet, sour, salty. I love it. All right. What taste will you encourage for him to minimize in his diet? Awesome. One at a time is fine. Anything else? Thank you. Yes, perfect. And then what might be another source of protein for him to consider in his diet? Think about the beginning of the class. Yes. Good job, everybody. All right. And then what is one tea you might recommend? What's one tea you might recommend? Perfect. CCF. Yep, all of those right from that list. And then I wanna ask, well, what are you gonna tell him about eating meat? How are you gonna educate him about eating meat? Reduce, all right, y'all. Um, I know we're down to our last three minutes of class, but if you happen to have Eat, Taste, Heal, I want us to quickly go back to pages 78, uh, 78 and 79. I wanna share something with y'all because you're gonna have clients who um, are big meat eaters, and so we know that Ayurveda flavor, uh, you know, we recommend a vegetarian diet, right? And fresh, you know, and organic and all that. All right. So while um, I'm reading off page 78, the middle page, while Ayurveda favors a vegetarian diet, it also offers specific guidelines for improving a meat-based diet. Choosing meat in accordance with the individual constitution is an important place to begin. Lighter meats are recommended for all the doshas, unless you're using meat for a specific med medicinal purpose, like for building tissues. Beef and pork are least recommended uh, for daily consumption due to their heavy ama producing qualities. On page 79, the proper seasoning of meat is another valuable tool for improving meat-based diets. Pungent spices like cumin and fennel greatly improve the digestibility of meat. And then proper cooking methods are all, also beneficial. For example, pitta and kapha types benefit from broiling or roasting meat rather than pan frying it in oil. Makes common sense, right? 
Vata types, on the other hand, may benefit from this added oil. Food combining principles, which we talked about at the beginning of the class, are also beneficial to consider due to the incompatibility of certain foods. For example, consuming meats with dairy products or fruits can, creates greater strain on the digestive system. And this is where we talk about education and recommendations for our clients. If you eat meat daily, try cutting back your serving sizes while experimenting with a larger variety of legumes and vegetables. Also try decreasing the frequency with which you can eat, eat meat. If you currently eat it two or three times a week or a day, try including it in just one meal a day, preferably lunch, right? Because the odds means stronger. And then you might also consider setting aside a meat-free day each week to give your digestive system a break, all right? So just wanted to share all that information because you will be having clients um, that are just meat eaters. So assignments real quickly. Um, you're gonna have an assignment to make the kashaya. <coughs> You'll see this, um, and then there's another assignment here to create a, prepare a soup for yourself. Um, and the, all the instructions are here. And then the last thing I wanna, oh my, my goodness. So I know that, um, uh, what happened? I had told y'all that I would be adding some, uh, a slide with some questions for you to start incorporating in your, um, your uh, your NAMA uh, review guide. So here are four questions. If you wanna take a snapshot of it, it's nine o'clock, so I'm gonna end my class, but please add this. I know that I encourage y'all to get a, a separate uh, notebook or a spiral where you can start uh, creating a little review guide for yourselves. These are three questions, four questions. And so every class I'll try to add, you know, two, three or four questions for you to add to your review guide so y'all can um, work on during the week. I hope that y'all had a great um, you know, rest of your day and thank y'all so much for your participation. Y'all are doing awesome. Thank y'all. Dr. Priyanka, um, would you like uh, a one minute break or are you ready to get started? It depends on them. If they want a one minute break, then we can start in a minute. Do you guys want a one minute break? All right, then we'll start in a minute's time. Let me know when you guys are back and when you're ready. All right, guys, are you back? Can we start? Yeah. 
नमामि धन्वंतर मादि देवम सुरासुरैहि वंदित पाद पद्मम लोक्य जलारु काय मृत्युनाशम दातारमीशम विवदाउषदीनम सो वी गोइंग टू स्टार्ट विद अग्नि um how familiar are you with the term agni what do you know about agni already what do you know about agni digestive fire yes 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 it is a sign of health yes anything else that you know about agni what dosha do you think that's that's those are your doshas your vata pitta and kapha the five sub doshas come from your from your vata pitta and kapha so we're going to talk about what agni is we're going to talk about an important concept which is digestion right we're going to talk about how agni is related to digestion why do we why do we um, care so much about the digestive fire we're going to talk about the functions of agni apart from digestion there are so many other things that agni does and then we're going to talk about the three different types of agnis the states of agni and so on so um i don't think we're going to cover armor and all that but these are things that normally come under agni where you'll have you know a comparison between agni and the doshas the different types of agni and finally we'll touch upon the topic of armor so um to begin with agni is something that ignites it literally translates into fire so um ajayanti when you said five sub doshas by any chance did you mean the pancha mahabhutas because agni is one of the five mahabhutas right uh, the five elements so uh, not the sub doshas but the pancha mahabhutas which are your space air oh okay we're talking about that right so that we'll talk when we talk about digestion right so um so related to agni the dosha that is closely related to agni and all that we'll talk about but agni is one of the five mahabhutas right you have space air fire water so that it is one of the five mahabhutas and here we are talking about agni which is your agni that's there within your body what does this agni do in your body what are the functions of agni and some qualities of agni so agni is hot it's sharp it's dry light mobile and subtle so agni is actually a little bit of a combination of which maha uh, sorry which doshas which dosha do you think is very closely related to agni in terms of the qualities of gunas yes pitta right it's hot it's sharp and so on and also it has some of those qualities of vata uh, it it is mobile it's light and things like that it's dry and which dosha is completely opposite of agni i mean that's right there kapha kapha is can you tell me the gunas of kapha that are opposite to that of agni some qualities of kapha yes it's slow yes yes it's sluggish it's dull yes very good oily yes cold wet heavy yes perfect so um yes cloudy pitchula yes it's like it's slimy and yeah so these are gunas of uh, of kapha and they are completely opposite of that of agni so if your agni is really dull and you know really slow what would what kind of gunas do you think you need to give to improve your agni as in if your agni is less if it's you know really low slow dull what gunas what qualities would you give to increase your agni yes other things mobile yes other qualities yes yes so you will basically give things that are similar to agni right so you will give gunas like you know you will give dravyas that are hot that are sharp that are dry why because they will help increase the agni because they are very similar to fire similar to agni and if your agni is too much it's 
it's too strong you need to bring it down what would you do what would you do if your agni is really sharp really strong it's too hot it's too sharp it's like it's too much it's, you know what would you do yes exactly right opposite qualities or get things that are cooling slightly heavy right slightly oil yes exactly so this word agni it literally means something that ignites ignites is a word that is derived from ignis which basically becomes your sanskrit word agni right so that's the derivation of the term so basically what happens in your body is your food is digested with the help of this agni and there's digestion there's absorption there's assimilation and transformation that happens and then finally it gives rise to your energy right so apart from digestion what else does agni help with agni is very important for awareness it's important for governing all the structural and functional activities of the cells and tissues it's important for digestion it's important for nutrition of all the tissues it is very important to neutralize and digest your armor if your agni is not strong it can lead to armor which is just basically food that's not digested and agni also plays an important role in your cellular intelligence and uh, cellular selectivity and choice and so on so basically this agni is the force of intelligence that is there within each cell in your body right each cell each tissue every system within the body has this agni and ultimately it is this discernment of agni that determines which substance enters the cell and tissues and which substance should be removed as waste and things like that so in that sense this agni actually becomes um, you know it, it it's something like the gatekeeper of life because it it plays an important role in all these important choices that happen inside the body it governs all the transformation that happens inside the body it is that bridge between the body the mind and the consciousness so if your agni is not there if there is no agni which is basically like your vital force there is no jiva there is no life so it is very important for you to balance this agni because if your agni is impaired it will lead to diseases it will lead to your ojas getting depleted it will lead to your immune system being compromised and then you are susceptible to various different kinds of diseases right so this is the importance of your agni so agni is radiant energy it manifests in the body in the form of your body temperature your digestive enzymes amino acids metabolic activities and the agni that we try to um, balance is this jhatar agni which is your gastric fire the digestive fire which is centered in the stomach and this agni is the main agni in the body this agni is what helps you digest your food this is the agni that helps in the uh, absorption assimilation breaking down of your food and metabolism and everything so this is your agni this is what agni does are you guys with me so far yeah okay so now we're coming to a concept called agni deva or the god of agni deva means god and agni is is your fire is your digestive fire so this agni is basically your physical fire but the energy in this physical fire is what we call agni deva right so um this is just a, a a depiction of how agni deva is to help you understand what all um what all this energy that is there in your physical fire what all that energy can do so two important things creation and destruction both happen with your agni if your agni is great there's creation right if your agni is impaired if it's totally spoiled that leads to destruction your gunas your uh, your doshas your manasika as well as your sharirika doshas are taken care of are kept in that state of balance only when your agni is sama so um, when you start doing your ayurveda we learn about a concept where we say for you to be healthy how does ayurveda define health 
for you to be healthy you need to have sama dosha sama dhatu sama agni mala so your doshas have to be sama sama means balanced your dhatus have to be balanced right so your agni is the third thing that has to be balanced and your malas have to be balanced malas are the waste by products that are excreted that also has to be balanced you should have the right amount of waste that's excreted from your body if your urine output is less that means there's a problem if your um your stools are you know either too much or too less or if there's a difference in the color or the consistency then you have a problem right so your agni actually plays an important role in ensuring that these doshas are kept under check it helps ensure that these dhatus are kept under check and if your uh if your uh, digestion is not good your stool production is going to be affected right um this this is just a depiction yeah this is just uh so um your yeah, your stools are going to be affected your urine output can be affected and so on so agni plays an important role in ensuring that all your other um uh, you know all your other uh, systems that support you know, the functioning of your body is kept in check is balanced and is maintained uh, it also as we studied right at the beginning it's what connects the physical body the mind and the consciousness right so this energy that's there is what we call the agni deva that's what is represented as the agni deva and each dhatu in your shariram has an agni component in it your system basically your body is made up of all the uh, pancha mahabhutas right in different permutations and combination you have uh, your pancha mahabhutas from head to toe your pancha mahabhutas in what you eat and what you drink in the herbs that you consume and everything that we do outside us within us everything so like that within our body each of these dhatus have an agni component um your your for your for all the functions that we uh, that we talked about it's this agni that does the main the main um, things for your body temperature for your enzymes for your metabolism all that you need this agni component to function right now we're coming to the concept of digestion now this is important so uh once you get this concept right you're going to understand everything else that we're going to talk about in this presentation right so here we are comparing digestion that happens within the body we're comparing it with how you cook food right so for you to for you to cook food for you to be able to um to make anything right say so so say we're going to make like a pot of vegetables so for you to be able to make a pot of vegetables what are the things that you need you need to have a pot you need to have you know water to cook your vegetables you need to have your vegetables ready um and then you need to be you need to you need to have fire to light up your thing to help with um uh, the cooking process right for your fire to light up you need to have a fire place you need to have uh you need to have some kind of fuel you need to have air that will help you light the fire and then the process of cooking starts now it's pretty much the same thing that happens within your system so you consume your food you have all are you um, are you familiar with the different uh, sab doshas are you all familiar with the different sab doshas of all the of, of vata pitta and kapha yes or no yes of vata and pitta okay so if i tell you if i tell you these sab doshas if i tell you clear the kapha if i tell you pachaka pitta will you be you've not you've not done the sab doshas of kapha yet okay so let me do this let me quickly okay so uh, here we're only going to talk about uh, clear the kapha uh, we're not going to really talk about the other kapha so you need to know the um, you need to know that um and bodhika kapha okay so what i'm going to do is let me just quickly revise the five sab doshas so that you know when we're talking about it you don't have any confusion so your vata you have prana udhana vyana samana and apana right these are the sab doshas of vata prana udhana vyana samana apana right so of 
pitta you have pachaka pitta which is like going to be the most important pitta here that we're going to talk about you have ranjaka pitta you have sadaka pitta you have alo chaka pitta and you have brajaka pitta right and for kapha you have five subdoshas but here i'm going to talk to you about uh, mainly about this kledaka kapha because that's the water content that's you know basically going to help uh, uh, it, it's just going to help with uh, your food getting moistened right that little lubrication that comes that is what we're going to talk about and then there's one kind of kapha that's present in your mouth which helps in the perception of taste called bodhaka kapha so just be aware of these two names and then as you do your other kaphas um you'll get familiar with it so we are only going to talk about bodhaka and kledaka right and i'm not i'm not going to explain too much about these sub doshas but uh, this is just for you to understand so if i put the concept out there it will be a lot more easier for you to comprehend this that's all right so can we start so what happens with digestion first you consume your food so the food goes into your mouth you taste the food with the help of this bodhaka kapha right it helps you perceive the taste of your food and then you swallow the food with the help of your prana vata you chew your food with the help of your udana vata you swallow the food your prana vata helps in swallowing the food now the food comes down now we are going to get into this process of digestion so now what happens the food is in your amashaya which is your stomach which is basically the pot you have your um, you have your kledaka kapha which will help moisten all the hard food particles that you've ingested um, it is also like the mucosa lining that's there in your stomach right so what does this lining basically do what does this this uh, moistening effect basically do it helps ensure that your stomach is protected from all the fire and the heat and the digestive enzymes and everything right so that that protective layer is your kledaka kapha now imagine if there were peas in this pot and there was no water and i'm just burning uh, i i started cooking it but there's no water there's nothing what will happen your peas will give out a little bit of water yes but after that what will happen yes exactly so how are we protecting that and then if it burns your pot which is going to get spoiled right so how do we protect that we're pouring this the we're pouring water in to help ensure that doesn't happen so that's what this kledaka kapha does right now your kledaka kapha helps with the moistening of all your hard food and with the lubrication and the mucosa lining and all that then you have your pachaka pitta which works along with this agni so pachaka pitta uh, is your um, you know is is um, your all the digestive enzymes and your um, your uh, it's basically that thing which helps your digestive fire digest the food it is it is um, it, it is what helps you digest the food and separate the food into the good portion and the portion the nutritious portion and the portion that's not required so this agni and pachaka pitta they work together so your pachaka pitta can be understood as the digestive enzymes that are there in your system as well as the digestive fire so this and your jhatara agni they work together and then they start cooking your food and then you have your uh, you also have your ranjaka pitta there which will help convert your food you know all the good then the the rasa the rakta all that conversion happens now you have your fire for your fire to burn you need to have some amount of air that comes in right so you need to have that air to light your fire and your fire burns now slowly what happens your enzymes are released your uh, digestive fire is going strong it cooks your food evenly and you add everything else that you need to your your, fire, your, cook, your food is cooked evenly and then the amount of kledaka kapha will slowly reduce right the water reduces now your food is prepared it's done and that is your process of digestion right now then slowly your you turn off your agni and then the next process happens where there's absorption and you know further um further processes happen in the system right so this is your this is what agni does in your body your agni takes all the food that you've eaten it helps 
break down the food with the help of all the other sub doshas with the help of your uh, pachaka pitta with the help of your um uh, you know with the help of your um um kledaka kapha with the help of the ranjaka pitta and then there's apana vata also there the samana vata in the uh, in in your uh, next to your agni and the samana vata is what helps burn the agni it helps ensure that there's a constant agni that is required and once all this is done finally the final stage you have apana vata which basically helps in the downward movement we don't have to get in there this much you need to know does this make sense are you are you with me so far yeah so basically you have your pot on you have your vegetables that are cooking in your pot and you have your fire and you have these these doshas now why why i even spoke to you about these doshas are uh, because there is a connection between your agni and the doshas and we're going to talk about that in a bit right so this is the concept you have your you have your pot you have your vegetables in it you put all your ingredients you light your fire you need air to help light your fire you need the right amount of kledaka kapha you need the right amount of samana vata you need the right amount of pachaka pitta and the your agni is kick started your agni starts digesting your food this is the process of digestion and this your food gets ready now keep this in mind we'll come back to the doshas and we'll come back to that connection in just a bit okay so apart from digestion your agni also has other uh, functions so the most important function is digestion or pakti where there is digestion absorption assimilation and your nutrition and you know energy and all that then it has visual perception called darshana matroshna is maintaining your body temperature so if there's no agni in your system your body temperature will come down you start becoming cold and if there's too much of agni if the agni is too strong your body becomes your extremities your body your skin it becomes very very hot prakriti varna your constitution and color complexion is is uh, determined by your agni shauryam confidence or courage prasada is mental clarity wholeness raga is um, affection interest or enthusiasm dhatu poshana um, is your dhatu nutrition tissue nutrition ojas production of your ojas your immunity the resistance that your body has harsha yes your matroshna is out of so um what generally happens there is for, for pitta prakriti um for pitta prakriti women who go through menopause they have excessive heat that's generated right um so there what really happens so here we're talking about the maintenance of your body temperature in the sense like you know your regular uh, uh balancing of the temperature that happens in your body yeah so uh, in um, um so this um hot flashes is not something that's common in all perimenopausal or menopausal women some of them don't have it but the ones who do they have a pitta imbalance there there is too much of pitta and there is matroshna that happens is out of uh, your you know your body temperature that's out of balance and then you start feeling extreme heat and all that yeah harsha is joy or happiness tejakara is production of tejas which is like the essence of you know your uh, pitta dosha uh, it helps in cell mem- membrane maintenance and metabolic activity prana kara is production and utilization of prana buddhi is your logical thinking and reasoning meda kara is intelligence and cellular communication flow dhairyam patience stability confidence dirgam is your dirga you life span long life span prabha is healthy glow and lustre and finally bhala which is your strength and vitality so these are the functions of agni so in your sharira you have 13 types of agni so you have most important thing would be your um, would be your jhataragni so apart from your jhataragni you also have uh, bhutagni and dhatu agni so first step of digestion is that your food goes into your stomach where you have your jhataragni and then your stomach digests you know all the processes that we were talking about that happens then the bhutagnis would kick in these bhutagnis are basically present in your liver so what these bhutagnis do is that 
each uh, bhuta, right? Each of these mahabhutas have a specific agni. Like you have a space agni, air agni, fire agni, water agni, and earth agni. And these specific bhuta agnis would digest their specific components that are present in your food. Say, for instance, if you have watermelon, right? So your, uh, uh, what bhutas do you think watermelon would have? What elements do you think watermelon? Yes, it'll have water and then yes, it would have some earth element, right? So what does your Bhuta Agni do? The water Agni will go digest the water component in the food. The earth Agni would go digest the earth component in the food. Uh, if there is some fire component in that food, the fire Agni would digest it. If there is space component, space Agni would digest it. And air component, air Agni would digest it. So it does that self-digestion uh, of its specific components. That is what the Bhuta Agni is doing. Then you have the next process where all your nutrition is absorbed, assimilated. The, it, it, it gets divided into sara and kitta. So sara is the nutritious portion that's going to undergo further processing. And kitta is that portion that is eliminated in the form of your stools, in the form of sweat, in the form of urine. It's removed from the body. Then you have your dhatu agnis that start doing its function. So after you've eaten your food, what do we eat food? What is all this nutrition for? For your energy and for you to get good immunity and resistance, right? So for that to happen, you need all your seven dhatus to be formed. So after your food is divided into the sara and kitta, then you have another entire process of dhatu formation where the first dhatu agni would digest the sara or the nutritious portion. It would form itself um, dhatu, as in if, if the first dhatu was your rasa dhatu. So the rasa dhatu agni would digest the sara portion and it would form rasa dhatu along with other components. And then the rakta dhatu would digest the, uh, you know, the nutritious portion from that and then the uh, mamsa dhatu and then so on, so on, so on. Finally, your shukra dhatu is formed. So each of these dhatus get formed in the process and finally your shukra dhatu is formed and then the essence of all these seven dhatus is what finally becomes your ojas, is what finally becomes that immunity, that resistance that you have, right? So these are the 13 different types of dhatus. You have one jhatara agni, sorry, uh, 13 different types of agni. You have one jhatara agni, you have five bhuta agnis, which are each of those mahabhutas. They have a specific agni and you have seven dhatu agnis. Are you familiar with the seven dhatu names? Are you familiar with the seven dhatu names? Yeah? All right. All of you? All right. So these are the 13 types of Agni. Now coming to your Agni and the Doshas. So there is no Agni without Pitta and there is no Pitta without Agni in the body. They both go hand in hand, right? So when you have, um, when you see symptoms of, uh, you know, as in when you see uh, qualities of Agni that increases, you will notice that very similar qualities that Pitta has that will also be on the rise and vice versa. So Pitta is your gross matter if you like look at this picture you will get an idea your agni is the energy which is you know a subtle matter and then you have a subtler energy which is called tejas which is like you know the essence which is like a which is like within that agni so these three they kind of go together they kind of work together uh, they help each other in their functioning in the body so this is one this is one part of it the second thing is that these three doshas that you have in your body, they affect your Agni. How do they affect your Agni? We'll see. So you remember when we spoke about the gunas of Agni, how you noticed that there were certain gunas that are similar to Vata, certain gunas that are similar to Pitta? Do you remember that? Do you recollect that? 
yeah like there's dryness there's lightness there's mobility that's similar to vata there's heat there's you know that sharpness that's related to pitta right and we saw how kapha is entirely opposite so let's do kapha first because that's the easiest kapha agni entirely opposite so what would happen what could kapha do to your agni what would kapha do to your agni yes it would slow down your agni it would make it dull it would decrease your agni exactly right now let's come to vata so we saw similar qualities of vata uh, and agni and also just from the way it is vata is cold agni is hot right so uh, what do you think vata would do to agni exactly there would be a varying effect for vata vata can increase your agni vata can decrease your agni as well right so there's a varying effect there's irregularity in the agni when vata it can become erratic so if there is too much of air that comes in it can blow out your agni and if there's less air there's you know uh, too little your agni is not strong and sometimes when your uh, uh, sometimes the the you know the uh, your agni starts burning too much and this air doesn't really contribute to balancing it out there can be too much of agni so this is what can happen now finally coming to pitta so in general what do you think should happen when there's too much of pitta similar qualities uh, what what should happen pitta and agni so we're talking about how pitta and agni aggravation yes so in general when there's too much of pitta it has to increase your agni now here we say pitta can increase or decrease your agni how can pitta decrease your agni any idea burning your food is actually when your agni increases a lot right now tell me how can pitta decrease your agni like if if someone comes to you with low agni with very you know with low agni the first thing that you would probably think about is how kapha is related to it uh right uh no not in terms of acidity okay i'll give you a clue yes exactly i was just going to tell you uh, to think about it. yes exactly the water element in pitta can actually water down your agni right perfect that's exactly what happens so sometimes when depending on the gunas that's the reason why we give so much importance to the gunas of these doshas um my vata can be high because one specific guna of vata might have increased in my system like the dryness of vata right um and maybe the others have not like uh, maybe the other qualities of vata has an aggravated so me this dryness has aggravated and irrespective of whether it's cold or hot i still have the dryness related to vata similarly your pitta because of heat when that heat element increases then it can lead to your agni increasing right but when the water element increases when the dravatvam of pitta increases it can water down your agni this is very important so sometimes you might have a person who has a pitta related issue but their agni might be low so you need to check on this water and you need to correct that only then can you correct because if you give the other things to just increase the pitta you're further aggravating the condition does that make sense yeah all right so now you remember how i told you to remember the doshas and i said we'll come to it in a bit right so here so the first thing is your summer state of agni where your agni is totally balanced it's in that perfect condition that it has to be for you to have good immunity for you to have good health and so on so when it is in that summer state it's balanced there's perfect agni when you when you eat your food there's the right amount of agni that comes in all your doshas are balanced so your um so your you know your bodhaka kapha is working really well your kledaka kapha is perfect it's ensuring that the mucosa is maintained your pachaka pitta is perfect the jhata agni is perfect your samana vata is perfect perfect everything is fine so here what can you do you can eat any kind of food it shouldn't give you any problem you're in a state of you know your health is perfect there's a balance you can use all the six rasas in your diet to maintain this sama agni avastha now 
going back to our pot i'm going to bring that example and then we're going to talk about this so um, i have my pot on and i have my food that's put in and i decide that i'm going to put my um, agni i'm going to turn down my fire i'm going to like you know turn it down 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 i'm going to keep it at the slowest and i'm going to set i'm going to set a time when i'm going to say in one hour i'm taking the food irrespective of whatever condition it's in but my fire is like at the least it's at the bottom most thing there's hardly any fire right now what's going to happen to my food yes it's going to cook less yes yes it's going to sit there it might build armor because my food might not cook at all right so in your body what dosha can lead to your agni being uh you know what what can possibly cause uh, and your agni suddenly be becoming slow or dull say for instance i have like the perfect food that's you know all perfectly cooked and waiting i'm waiting to eat the food just before i go to eat my food i decide that i'm going to drink cold water i'm i'm going to like you know drink a lot of cold water what can possibly happen to my agni i'm like i'm making it really slow i'm making it dull right so what dosha can possibly do that it has to be something that has qualities that are opposite of agni so what dosha can make my agni slow and dull kapha dosha right so do you understand how that happens so say i have yeah so i have my agni but i've reduce my agni my agni is really slow so that can happen when it is related to kapha because kapha is something that can actually you know slow down my agni uh and now what happens to the food the food is just sitting there it's becoming a mess because it's not cooking properly so there's hypometabolism that can happen right your food is not cooking properly so what happens within your system your food doesn't completely digest your food is just like sitting there your metabolism reduces that's the reason why people who have manda agni have a tendency where they actually might not eat a lot of food but what they eat also the metabolism rate is really bad so they start ending up gaining a lot of weight there's edema there's swelling there's no appetite they start you know feeling that congestion that happens and then you start craving for food with the opposite qualities you start craving for dry food for hot spicy food because somehow you want this this uh you know this this congested feeling to kind of ease out right so generally what happens is there's a craving for food that has opposite rasas are you able to make is this like coming together for you so when you have someone who comes with manda agni what can you do you give them herbs that are pungent that are bitter like you give them something that's warming like trikatu or cinnamon or whatever and ginger and things like that that will help that will help your agni get stronger and better so you give qualities that are what to your agni what qualities would you give for manda agni your agni is slow your agni is less yes you give qualities that are similar to agni to help increase your agni right now i'm i'm going to talk to you about an other scenario so i have my food that's kept there i've poured water i've done everything now i've decided to put my fire at the highest and i've gone out i'm not stirring my food i'm not doing anything but i've just gone out i've gone out i'm not looking at anything that's happening so my food has cooked i don't turn off the fire i've just let it uh i've just let it on now the the fire cooks my food it cooks my food and then it starts what what happens to my food it starts burning my food the food becomes dry right so now so what dosha can possibly cause this 
where there's too much of fire, there's Yes, it's usually related to pitta. Why? Because the qualities are similar and that heat is too much. That burning happens because there's too much of heat. There's too much of that, you know, that uh, too much of agni. There's tikshna agni. And it will lead to heartburn. It can lead to hot flashes. Uh, so you, we were talking, You uh, someone asked me this question, right? About your, uh, about your matroshna. This is what actually happens in that case, right? Um, and you start you start having hypermetabolism. So you eat food and your food like quickly, quickly, quickly will digest. And then you start feeling hungry again. Now what happens to your mucosa? Your mucosa starts burning up, right? You start, you start having heartburn. And what is the one condition that can possibly happen? When you start having heartburn and yes, because you're burning up everything. So obviously there's no absorption of nutrients that happens. Yes, right. Right? And then what can happen? So you start, you start seeing symptoms. You start seeing, uh, yes, exactly. You start seeing ulcers. You start seeing acidity. When you have acidity, you say, right, I feel a heartburn. There's something that's happening. Uh, that, that burning sensation and all that. Also, it can lead to increased anger, being critical about things. These are all very pitta-related symptoms that you see. And you start craving for things that are slightly cooling. You start craving for things that, have, that are sweet, um, and all that. So here, what can you do when you have tikshna agni? You use mild sour herbs. Or you can use guduchi, shatavari, amchur. And you usually mix it with an anupana that's slightly cooling. Like you can use buttermilk or uh, use aloe vera juice or you use, uh, you know, rose water. You use things that are slightly cooling to help bring it under control. Also, when you have these menopausal hot flashes and when you have, you know, symptoms that are very similar to this, you can use very similar herbs because Again, your pitta is increased over there. Now, if you have a condition where your pitta has increased, but you don't see tikshna agni, you see really manda agni, you need to understand that it's the water element. So you need to correct the water element and that will automatically get corrected. But usually when your pitta is related to some issue with the agni, the agni becomes tikshna, right? Unless it is related to water and you have like, you know, too much of water that's gone and watered down your agni. Right now, coming to my last scenario, I decide I'm going to cook outside. I take, uh, I take my. Um, uh, for water, you need to do something like you know you need to make sure that um, you don't um, you don't drink too much of water before you eat your food. So you don't you don't keep, keep sipping on water before you eat your food, and you treat it with mild heating uh, substances like you can use. Uh, you can use some trikatu, you can use some hingwashtika churnam and all that. But the trick there is to help ensure that your pitta doesn't get further vitiated. You give it in buttermilk or you give it along with the rice. So that little bit of warming action happens, but that it, it doesn't aggravate too much of heat related to pitta. So you give it with uh, that. You just So since the water has watered down your food, you need to build that agni back. For that, you need uh, any of your deepana pachana herbs can be used. But if it is pitta, your pitta is very high, you give pitta pacifying uh, anu, uh, anupana. You can also use gritta. Gritta is like one of the most effective anupanas in this case. So you can just mix the powders, the warming powders with ghee and you can uh, administer it. Right? Okay. Now I've taken my pot out. I've kept it in a place. It's very windy. So what happens is I have my food. I have, you know, everything kept ready. But then sometimes there's too much of air, too much of wind and my fire becomes less. And then suddenly the, there's no wind and it's, it's, it's right. And then my fire starts, um, it, it starts, you know, it becomes really sharp. It becomes very strong. Then again, there's water, there's air, there's, you know, fire becomes less. Again, fire becomes more. Um, this just keeps happening. Now, what happens to my food? Yeah, my food can dry out. My food can get cooked in bits and pieces, right? They can because there's sudden increase in fire. There'll be pieces that would be that would burn. Then there, there's suddenly no fire. There would be you know portions of my food that will clump up together. So there's irregular cooking that happens because there, you don't have that constant agni, right? So here, what can happen? You can have your uh, you can have symptoms like gas. You can have symptoms like constipation. Um, you can have symptoms, uh, you know, where you have severe pain, 
you know very vata related symptoms you'll start seeing and you start craving for food that's hot that's spicy uh, that's you know that's that's kind of fried things like that so what you can use here is use sweet and pungent herbs like hingu trikatu chitraka with the appropriate anupanas and you help bring that agni under uh you you have to regularize the agni right and then you bring it under control yes yes exactly so that's what can happen so here what happens is in some cases of ibs you know you notice that the agni is irregular uh you know they they would have these bouts of constipation and suddenly they would have uh, diarrhea and then loose stools and then again constipation and then it, it would be accompanied with severe gas bloating and severe pain and things like that because the fire is erratic so you need to strengthen the fire and you need to regularize it that's very important otherwise there's no point right so that becomes very important so what are things that can impair your agni eating too much food or too little food in one shot eating at the wrong times of the day how many of you here eat food at 11 o'clock 12 o'clock midnight 1 o'clock in the morning 2 o'clock in the morning anybody here who has those you know those weird cravings where you want ice cream at 1 in the morning or you want to you know you just want to eat something because you're watching some show you want to you want to try and go eat food that is that is the most common cause for agni impairments right and this is very common amongst people who work late at night because they have late night calls and they you know they they're sitting up late at night so they have this tendency to eat food because you're you're up when you should be sleeping right even during the day when you eat meals in between your two meals like between your uh, breakfast and your lunch if you decide to have something uh, not not a healthy snack like you know you can have a little bit of buttermilk that might not affect you but if you decide to have something that's very unhealthy in between two meals and then you you know without waiting for that hunger uh, sometimes you don't eat because you're hungry you eat because you're doing something and you just want to munch on food right so that snacking can lead to agni impairment or skipping meals especially for those you know people who are working um, long hours and they forget to eat a meal because of work or these crazy diets where you don't eat two three meals and you know you're fasting and you don't eat meals and then you suddenly have a really heavy meal when your agni is not up to it that can lead to impairment of agni bad combinations virudha aahara like yogurt with fruit you know your citrus fruits with milk combining foods that shouldn't go together that can lead to agni impairment stress when you're eating your food uh, you know for that matter even when you keep talking when you eat your food or if you're watching television and eating your food or you just kind of uh, you're not concentrating you try to eat really fast because you're in the middle of work or whatever so you you eat too much of food you're not concentrating you don't really chew your food you kind of swallow your food all that can lead to your agni getting impaired having cold water or ice with your meals before your meals after your meals everything would impair your agni so uh, ice cold water with meals is a very very bad idea you're watering down your agni and lack of exercise there is no metabolism in the body lack of exercise adds to your kapha getting too high and your manda agni you know your agni gets really low and slow and dull so to understand the person's agni to assess your agni you need to know what food they eat you need to know what drinks uh, what beverages they have you need to know what snacks they have you need to know whether it's processed you need to know whether how many times they drink coffee tea alcohol consumption uh, what is their um, their in their intake of processed food so if if there's too much of frozen food canned food you know they eat out a lot all that can lead to agni uh, being impaired also the kind of food that they eat so if there's too much of you know um, junk frozen food uh, or, or people who eat cold food I, there are people who actually take food out of the refrigerator don't warm the, the don't heat up the food and they eat it just like that all that can lead to the agni becoming very dull and slow and low um, too much of dried food you know frozen food and all that can lead to um, your vata getting very high and your you know you having erratic agni uh so you, like that you need to see what kind of food they eat how much of animal based protein do they have is it processed 
um, um, is the food that they eat, is it raw, is it cooked? Um, do they eat food from out a lot? Even salads from out uh, can might not sit well with everybody, right? So uh, people who have manda agni, uh, people who have um, uh, who have who are very vata prakriti, raw salads, raw food is not great for them. So uh, depending on the constitution, depending on the agni, you need to. So these are things that will help you understand what the agni is uh, and what kind of uh, medicines you need to give them. Right. So do they digest the food easily? Is it uh, is the appetite strong? Also, when is the appetite strong during the day at night? Is, do they eat they, do, do they eat a very heavy meal for breakfast or for dinner? That's a very important question. Um, how is your energy during the day? How often do you feel heavy after you've eaten food? Do you feel sleepy after you've eaten food? Um, do you have problems like gas, bloating, belching, heartburn, indigestion? Um, you also need to ask questions about allergies, about you know uh, any kind of discomfort. So there are people who have salad cucumbers and they immediately have a vata reflux. There are some people who have uh, issues when they have, um, you know, um, peanuts. Um, and I'm not talking about allergies, but I'm talking about very vata related symptoms. Like, you know, they immediately have gas and bloating sensation and things like that. There are some people who react to lime like that. Uh, you know, immediately they have that acidity that, you know, and heartburn and there's that uh, pitta uh, symptoms that they see. So these are some questions that you need to ask. Also allergies. So there are certain foods that don't, uh, you know, that don't suit certain people. So allergies and things like that have to completely be omitted because if you are allergic to something and you have it, that will, um, you know, that, that that's not correct. So the next thing that you need to find out about is the bowel movements. Are they regular? How often do they pass? Do they eat and immediately, um, you know, do they have to immediately use the toilet? Um, when do they usually have the bowel movements? Is it in the morning, evening, afternoon, night? You know, and how are the stools? Is it soft? Is it medium? Is it hard? Also, you can ask them questions about the odor, which will help you understand whether they are digesting their food. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people would tell you that there's a lot of oily, fatty uh, content in the food. Um, um, sometimes they would tell you that, you know, the, I mean, in the stools. Um, sometimes they would tell you that uh, it's variable consistency, like sometimes they constipated, then uh, later on during the day, they again have that urge and then there's, there are loose stools. So um, you need to ask questions about the, uh, the mala to understand. That will give you an idea about the agni, also about the dosha that's vitiated. So if the, if the bowel is slow, if it's sluggish, heavy, um, the appetite is dull, then you're looking at something, you're looking at, you know, a possible manda agni with a very kapha related issue. If there's constipation, dry heart stools, a lot of gas and flatulence, and also sometimes, you know, with pain, then you're looking at vishama agni with a very vata kind of um, symptom. And the bowels would be one or, you know, less than that also a day. Two to four, prone to loose stools and acid reflux or acidity and they have a very strong appetite then you might be looking at a tikshna agni kind with a very pitta related issue and armor so armor is basically food that's not digested how do you understand armor you can look at the tongue and see whether there's a white coating even after brushing uh, irrespective of whether you've eaten food that has color or you know it, it, it's just there throughout and it doesn't go even after you've brushed and you've scraped your tongue so that can be armor. So there certain things that you can understand with armor is that a person always feels tired, will be sluggish even after they've had a good night's sleep. Uh, they wouldn't digest their food at all. And that food can, you know, sit, uh, it, it, it would just sit there. Uh, there would be a very, um, a very um, striking odor, a foul odor that's related to armor and, you know, things like that. So how you examine it is basically look at the tongue. If it's a whitish coating, the armor is usually related to your kapha. If the coating is slightly yellowish, you might be looking at a pitta-related armor. And if it is slightly brownish, then it could be a vata kind of armor. So, um, so we'll actually talk more about armor later. You're just starting. This is just an introduction to your agni and you know to what what kind of agni a person might have and you know things like that. So. Uh, 
yeah so i think these are for your homework monica she'll tell you i'm not sure about what homework assignments you have but do you guys have any doubts in what we've done today so we spoke about agni we've spoken about digestion we've we've covered the different kinds of agni you have 13 different types